Yes, Wendy. Uh, can you see the screen? Is it... I can see it perfectly. Okay, great. Um, well, anyway, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's truly my pleasure to be here and speak with you about uh, grafting, budding, and, and air layering or uh, a few other techniques that we'll touch on for propagating fruit trees. And uh, we got a lot of uh, ground to cover, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get started um, quickly. It's always a good idea, I think, when you're talking about something is to kind of lay down a few definitions so everybody understands exactly uh, what we mean when we use certain terms. And so for grafting, um, we would define that as the joining together of two separate plants. Uh, that's critical uh, because grafting um, gives us the ability to combine two different, at least two different plants, maybe even more, uh, with the um, utilizing the benefits of, of both plants. So it's a way of, of creating a composite plant that has characteristics that neither, uh, that no other plant would have at that point in time. Uh, budding is simply a type of grafting. So grafting kind of encompasses all types of, of combining of two plants, two or more plants together. Budding is a specific type of grafting where we only transfer a single bud from one plant to another. And that's usually easier to do. So uh, we'll talk more about this, but it, when we can get away with budding, it's quicker and easier and less dangerous to the butter, less chance of hurting yourself. So it's the preferred method if we can do it. Uh, but some, some plants, you have to do other grafting techniques. Um, so let me kind of back up a little and talk about propagation in general <clears throat> and asexual versus sexual propagation. Okay? Sexual propagation is like flowering, pollination, fruit set, and you have the zygotic embryo. Uh, so you've got uh, uniqueness, you, you know, when you have pollination and, and fruit set and the development of a zygote, you're, you're getting a mixing of genes in different ways that your, your uh, young plant is gonna be different, just like you're different from your parents. You're not exactly like your mother or your father. You're your own self and you're unique. Well, that's the way, you know, that's the way the uh, sexual reproduction in plants works as well. But let's say we have, you know, we have some plants that have characteristics that we like and we want to maintain those plants. Uh, well, then we can produce what we call clones, which are genetically identical plants. And we do that by various methods um, of asexual propagation. So that's one of the advantages of asexual propagation is to propagate plants and maintain all the traits and characteristics of the mother plant or the plant you're propagating. So there's different ways of, you know, there's all different types of asexual propagation, cuttings and so on. And, and we'll talk about air layering and different types of layering and so forth. Um, but some plants, um, are difficult to propagate from cuttings, let's say. And so they're actually easier to propagate by grafting. So that would be one way that grafting would come into the picture of asexual propagation. And the other way is, as we mentioned before, you're combining two plants together. So you can get the best of both worlds. So let's say you have an apple variety that is really, really good. But if you rooted a cutting of it, the root system might be weak and it might be susceptible to nematodes and it might have other problems. So you take that really, really good apple variety and you graft it on a rootstock that may be resistant to those soil related problems. And so the com combination is better than either of the, the uh, 
component parts. So with a grafted plant, so that's one of the, that's the main reason today that we graft and bud is to get those characteristics all in one plant. And so we, the terminology is the scion is the top upper part of the plant above the graft union, the part of the plant that produces flowers and fruit. Uh, the rootstock is the other part of the plant. That's the part of the plant below the graft union that produces the, the lower trunk and the root system. Now, in some cases, we have inner stocks. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but that would just be a third plant that would be in between the scion and rootstock. And there's reasons for doing that, but let, let's not go there right now. So reasons for grafting. We already talked about this. Some, some species are difficult to root by cuttings or other methods, so grafting works real well. And this was probably more important many, many years ago. And you know, during historical times when we didn't have electricity, we didn't have misting beds, we didn't have synthetic root, rooting hormones. And so about the only way they could propagate some of these plants was by grafting, which they had figured out through trial and error. Um, so nowadays though, we do grafting and budding or grafting, which includes budding. We do that so we can get the beneficial characteristics of both the rootstock and the top of the plant, the scion. So what are some of those characteristics that we might be able to get through having a rootstock? Well, here's a, here's a short list and it's not all inclusive by any means, but it includes most of the major reasons or benefits that a rootstock could, could impart to a grafted plant. Now, any particular rootstock isn't going to have all these characteristics, okay? It may have some of them, but um, these are just common characteristics, beneficial characteristics that rootstocks can add to a fruit tree or a fruit plant. Okay, insect and nematode and disease tolerance, drought tolerance. Some roots, you know, some rootstocks have extensive root systems where the uh, mother plant, if propagated on its own root, might have a real shallow root system. Size control. This is really, really important with apples and, and some other fruit trees as well. But I don't know if you're aware of it or not. Some of you are, I imagine, but some of you may not be. But a lot of apple orchards are grown on size controlling rootstocks. And these are rootstocks that reduce the overall size of the plant. This makes the plant easier to manage, easier to prune, easier to spray, easier to thin. And if you have smaller trees, you can just put more of them in a given area. So you actually have more fruit bearing surface exposed to sunlight than you would with, a, with bigger trees, where the interior part of the tree is kind of like dead wood in the sense that it's not productive. It's not dead, but it's not productive because it's too shaded. So size control, very important in some crops. Uh, fruiting at an earlier age. Wendy mentioned that uh, her avocado wasn't grafted and it took a long time. It was from a seedling. And so it has to go through this juvenile stage as seedlings do. And so it takes much longer for some plants to come into fruit production. If they're grafted, uh, if the graft is taken from, a mat from mature wood and put on a rootstock, then mature wood is what will grow. And so the plant will come into fruiting at an earlier age. Um, fruit quality, fruit size and yield can all be influenced by rootstocks. Cold hardiness, very important with citrus. You know, the old citrus rootstocks like sour orange, for example, it's very cold hardy. Uh, rough lemon, which is another old citrus rootstock, is very sensitive to cold. So depending, you know, on the rootstock, you can have a wide variation in, in cold tolerance with certain rootstocks. And then salt tolerance can also come into play. And so these are just some examples. There are others, but we won't belabor the point. Um, okay, aside from, from using a rootstock, 
There are some other reasons, they're relatively unusual, but there are other reasons that we might graft or bud. And I'll show you pictures of this later, but repairing damaged trees is one reason. Top working, that means changing the variety. If you have a pecan grove, and let's say it's Stuart pecan, which is an old standard, and the trees are like 30 years old and they're great big trees, and then you decide you want a different cultivar of pecan, well, you don't want to rip out those 30 year old trees because it's going to take years to regrow a tree. But you can cut it back and you can top work it by grafting onto the ends of these large um, limbs that you've cut back. And I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. But that's another, another reason for grafting is top working, which is essentially changing the variety in an existing orchard without starting over. Um, and then this is kind of like a novelty, but it's interesting for the home gardener. You can grow more than one cultivar on a single tree by grafting different cultivars on different limbs of a rootstock, or you can even have different species in some cases, like citrus. You can have a citrus rootstock and you can graft grapefruit, mandarin, sweet orange, all on the same plant. And, you know, these sometimes are referred to as fruit salad trees. They're kind of novelties. Nobody does that commercially, but, but in the home garden, you know, as a conversation piece, it, it can be interesting. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the principles for successful grafting and budding. Um, let, me, let me get something here. I don't know, you can't see this, but I have a, a bag that I carry to the field with me that has all the stuff I need for grafting and budding. And uh, I have pictures of most of this stuff, but, but I just wanted to be able to show it to you if I need to. So it's very important when you're going to do grafting or budding that you get plant material that's at the correct stage of growth and development. You and, and you know, and this is specific to the crop. There's no, uh, you know, rule of thumb that applies to everything, but you have to know your crop, do a little research and know what kind of tissue works best for the procedure that you're going to be doing. So the proper stage of growth and development very important. Healthy, disease-free plant material. This is also important. Um, if the plant material has some problem, some physical or disease problem or insect damage or what have you, it's really going to hurt your chances of successful uh, bud take or grafting take. Um, and the rootstock plant must not be stressed before or after budding and grafting. We'll talk more about aftercare in a little while, but let's say you have rootstock plants growing in containers in a greenhouse or in a nursery or in your backyard somewhere. Well, you'd wanna make sure they're well watered and they're not drought stressed before you do any kind of grafting or budding on them. Okay, the same thing goes for, for bud wood. The, Bud wood that you collect has to be at the right stage of growth and development to be uh, successful. This example here on the right is uh, citrus. And so you can see here two young, if you're familiar with citrus wood, it, the young wood is kind of angular, it has ridges on it. And so it's sort of angular. That makes it difficult to work with. So it's better if the wood is rounded, it's a little more mature, it's usually at least one flush back from the terminal flush. And if you get too far back though, where you start getting a lot of corky bark development, uh, sometimes that wood doesn't work as well. So the best wood is this in-between wood, which is round and about pencil diameter. Now that's citrus. Every you know, every plant is a little bit different and you just have to be familiar with the plant that you're working with. Um, okay, 
when you're collecting budwood, collect healthy non-stress plant material, just like with your rootstock, you want it healthy and non-stress. So when would you collect that? It would probably be in the morning because in the morning, uh, the water status of the plant is at its optimum, all other things being equal. So if you have a plant that's been well irrigated at night, it's going to recover and it's gonna be, uh, have a better water status first thing in the morning than it will as the day progresses, that it'll, uh, the water status of the plant will become lower and lower until the nighttime comes again and it recharges. So it's best to collect the cyan wood in the early part of the day rather than in mid afternoon or something like that. Uh, but the plant should be well irrigated and not stressed. Know the cultivar you're collecting and label it. You know, always bundle and label your cyan wood because you may think, well, I'm just collecting three different things today and I can keep them straight. But, you know, you get out there and before long, um, things get mixed up. And so always bundle and label your sign wood so you know what it is. And then once you collect it, uh, you need to uh, keep it in a cool, moist environment until you're ready to use it. And you can store it. Uh, most, most bud wood can be stored for, you know, a few days to even a couple two or three weeks or longer in some cases, depending on the plant. Uh, but the thing to do with the budwood is remove the leaves because you don't want leaves on there that's gonna help the, the budwood dry out because the leaf is just gonna be evaporating water. So remove the leaves and then uh, bundle them up, store them with some moist, something moist like some uh, peat moss that's moist but it's been squeezed out so it's not wet, it's just moist or moist paper towels. Put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in the refrigerator. Don't let it freeze but keep it cool and you can store it like that for a while. Um, okay, so the tools that you use are very important, okay? And so you're going to need First and foremost, a really sharp knife. Doesn't need to be big. And this is um, a typical budding knife. You know, I've got one right here. I, I guess that's not, not in focus, but um, you can see it here. And these knives, you know, they're not super cheap. Uh, maybe 30, 30 to $40 for a good budding knife, but it'll last a long time take care of it and it and even if you don't have one of these what you need is a knife that is razor sharp you know the sharper the better and and the thing about these knives is it, they're easier to sharpen and they're designed in a way that you can get them really sharp so i recommend these but a small pocket knife as long as it's super sharp you can use that uh, to get it that way you need a good stone and you need oil, a lubricant for the stone. And there's a technique to sharpening a knife and I don't really can't show you very well um, through this format. When I teach this class in person, we go over knife sharpening, but you can Google it and see. And there, you know, there's a, a bit of a skill involved there, but you need to get your knife really, really sharp. And then uh, you need, some kind of something to wrap the bud with. Um, the picture you have there is budding tape. And I prefer the clear kind, but you can get that green kind as well. But the important thing, like here's a little piece of, of budding tape. Now watch, see how far it goes before it broke. Stretches out to about four or five times its initial length. And the reason that's important is when you're wrapping it, you can get it really tight because you can pull each time you wrap, each time you go around, you can pull it, go around and pull it, overlap each wrap. And with the tape like that that stretches, you can get it really tight and get a good sealed wrap on there. 
there's no adhesive on this tape. It doesn't have any adhesive. It's just uh, a material that that wraps well because it's because it stretches. And uh, there are some techniques. Instead of using tape, they use what's called budding rubbers, which are essentially like rubber bands, strips of rubber. They look like rubber bands that have been cut, and they can hold the bud in place, but they don't seal the bud off as well. So certain, certain plants, you can use budding rubbers with, but in general, budding tape, when in doubt, budding tape is better because it conserves, keeps the, the area where you want the healing to occur, keeps it from drying out, seals it off. Okay, so, we're going to talk about several budding and grafting techniques. Probably the most common one, because it's easy to do, is the T bud, or sometimes called the shield bud. And so anybody can learn this technique. It's pretty easy, and you may not have great success the first time or two, but it won't be long before you can do this. Um, certain plants, though, will not respond well to tea budding. So you have to use it on a plant that responds well. A couple of examples, citrus does well. Peaches, plums, and nectarines do well. I think apples do pretty well. Uh, but there are certain plants that won't do well with, with the tea bud. And that's usually because their bark is real thin. And as you'll see in a minute, in this technique, if the bark's too thin, it'll tear. So you need to do this when the bark is slipping, when the bark of the rootstock is slipping. What do I mean by that? Um, when the plant is actively growing, you can cut the bark and peel it away from the wood. I don't know if you've ever done that or done it by accident or just messing around, observed it. But when a tree or a plant is actively growing, the bark will slip. That means it will separate from the wood. If it's not actively growing, the bark is tight and it won't separate from the wood. So you need that slipping bark to do this technique. And I'll show you a couple pictures here and then uh, we'll try to go to a link that shows it even better. But you start off, this is the cyan. You're making a cut underneath, there. here's the bud. You're making a cut underneath the bud there. Um, now this cut needs to be very smooth because you're exposing the cambium layer and you want a smooth cut, then you underneath the bud, then you come up above the bud and you make another cut down to meet your first cut and then you can pull the bud off. Now, here in this picture, they're pulling the bud off and they're leaving the, un, the wood underneath. And that's the way you do it with peach and nectarine and plum. But with citrus, that little sliver of wood comes off with the bud. So either way, some with some plants, you will just remove the bark and phloem and cambium like this and leave the wood there. And in other species like citrus, the wood will come off with the bud. But in any event, you've made this tea you make a T incision in the rootstock. I don't, I guess I don't have a good picture of that, but we'll see it in a minute, I, I think. You do that by making a vertical cut. Pretend this bud is not here right now. You see, you make this vertical cut in through the bark, but to the wood, but not into the wood. Then you make a horizontal cut. So you end up with these bark flaps. Then you take the bud above where you made that horizontal cut and you push the bud underneath these bark flaps. So here, here you got it right here. That's kind of a big limb to be doing this on, but it shows, but the picture is good. Shows how you get that T bud or shield bud underneath the bark flaps. Now, here's another series of pictures. This is citrus. With citrus, they do the inverted T. It's essentially the same thing, but it's upside down. And the reason they do that is primarily because citrus may bleed a little, sap may get in there, 
and this allows it to drain out better than if you had the upright T. So trying to keep it from flooding, they call that flooding. So here we are cutting underneath on the, this is the, the, the uh, science bud stick, cutting underneath here. And then we have that T incision again, but this time it's an upside down T with the horizontal cut down here. Then we push the bud up under the bark flaps. Then we tie it off. And after about two and a half to three weeks, we can remove that tape. And if the bud is still green and turgid and it's not brown, turning black or brown from the ends and shriveling, then we know it's survived and, and it's we have what we call a, a successful bud tape. Okay, now in a minute, we'll talk about forcing the bud. When we do this kind of grafting, let me back up, let's see. Okay, this, you see where a notch has been cut out here? This is a great big limb. This is a little unusual. It's not what we normally think of when we're T-budding, but the reason that notch is there is to interfere with the flow of auxin, which is inhibiting this from growing. So if you ever wondered why on a shoot, whoops, going the wrong way, sorry. On a shoot, you have these dormant buds. Not every bud is growing. Everywhere there is a leaf, typically there's a bud in the leaf axle. And that bud is not necessarily growing. It's just the buds that are up at the end of the shoot at the top, usually that are growing. And it's because those growing points produce growth regulators that inhibit these other buds from growing. So these other buds won't grow. Say there's probably a bud right here and a bud right there. And then the bud we put in right here. And none of those buds are gonna grow unless you disrupt that flow of, of uh, auxin, plant, a plant growth regulator known as auxin from the growing tip, moving down uh, the stem here. So we have to do what we call forcing these buds. Once we get a successful bud take like, like this, then we have to force the bud. And we do that either by removing the top or bending it over or doing something to disrupt what we call apical dominance. So we do something to make this bud grow by preventing the buds above it from inhibiting it. And the way to do that is either to remove them or bend them over where they're not above this bud. I hope y'all, I hope everybody gets that. That's called bud forcing. And that's what we do uh, when you're budding. That's like one of the last things you do to get the bud to grow. But let's, let's move from the, um, from the, T bud, let's go ahead and move to the chip bud. Oh, wait a minute, let's see. Yeah, yeah, we'll go to the chip bud. And it's different because with the chip bud, there are no bark flaps. You don't peel the bark back. You simply remove a chip of wood like you see here. Okay, uh, let's say this is the rootstock. So you remove a chip of wood and then from your scion, you would remove a similar piece of wood containing a single bud. And then you put that bud that you removed on where you removed the chip on the rootstock you line the cambium up. The cambium is gonna be this layer right here under the bark, between the bark and the wood. And it's important to line the cambium of the bud, the chip bud that you cut out with the uh, cambium, the layer of cambium on the rootstock. You have to have cambium against cambium uh, to have good, uh, good take. 
so let's let's go here. I think there's there's other pictures here that might be instructive. Okay, so here we are. This is the rootstock plant. You've removed a chip where you're going to put your cyan bud, and you see that creamy green tissue underneath the bark. That's your that's your um, cambium, and so then you remove a bud from your roots from your cyan, like so, like you're, you're showing here. And then you place it. So here's your bud that you cut off from the cyan. Then you place it here on the rootstock. And you have, again, you have to line the cambium of the two up so they match. Now, if this bud is a little smaller than the rootstock, sometimes you just line one side up and the other side won't match because this might be smaller than that doesn't always match exactly. The better it matches, you know, the, the better the contact will be uh, between the rootstock and the cyan. But if it's the different, if it's not the same size, then you match up one side if you can. And uh, so anyway, that, that's the chip bud. Now, if you were trying to decide between the chip bud and the T bud, it would come probably come down to is the bark slipping or not and if you can propagate a, a rootstock plant while the bark is slipping using the tea bud that would be the preferred method usually um, but sometimes you can't do everything as quick as you want and so you would in those cases you would need uh, to perhaps use the chip bud. So the, those are the two budding techniques that are most commonly used, the T bud, the T bud and the chip bud. Now let's talk about some grafting techniques. Grafting is a little harder. It's more complicated because the cuttings, uh, I mean, the cuts that you make are usually more difficult than with budding. So it requires a little more skill and a little more know-how. Um, so if you're gonna try grafting, uh, you know, become familiar with handling the knife, um, just practice on some plants that aren't what you really want to use just to get a feel for making the cuts. Be careful. Uh, they sometimes they make these thumb protectors that you can put oh, it's like a thick rubber thing you can put over your thumb uh, because a lot of times if you're going to get cut quite often it turns out to be your thumb. But um, just have to be careful and learn how to do it carefully. So Whip grafting is by far the most common grafting technique used to propagate young plants. Um, if, you're, if you can't bud, you'd be whip, you would try whip grafting next. Uh, whip grafting, again, it's important that you line up the cambium layers of the two plants. Here's an example of where the top or the cyan is smaller diameter than the rootstock. So they're going to line it up on one side and hope that that works. But the closer it is to the, to the same size, the better, because you'll have more cambium tissue that you can potentially align. Um, I have, let me see here. Let's see, let's go to this link real quick. There's some better pictures. Okay, these, these are the, sorry, this isn't what I thought it was, but I think it shows uh, what you need to do. This would be the top, the cyan. It's turned upside down so they can make the cut. So the first thing they do is they make a, a, a slanting cut all the way through the wood. 
So you've got this piece of wood. Then you make a secondary cut about a third of the way from the top or bottom of, depending on how you have it oriented, about a third of the way. You make another cut and you did the same thing on the root stock and then you intertwine the two and I've got to find the better picture. I have a better picture of this. Um, here it is, I think. Yes, this is what I was looking for. So this shows it a little better. So here's the stock and, you know, kind of disregard all these roots. I don't know why they have all these roots growing here. That's a little unnatural looking. You, it's not usually what we're dealing with, but you make an angle cut like this about an, anywhere from an inch to a couple inches long, depending on the diameter of the rootstock. Uh, then you make a second cut, you come down about a third of the way and you make a second cut like this, where you see that dashed line. And it ends up looking like this when you pull it apart, okay? That's called the whip and tongue technique. Then you do the same thing on the scion. You make that angle cut, then you make a second cut like that. And so you end up having these plants here, these two, this being the top, this being the bottom. And then you press them together and intermingle them. So you have lots of potential for, for cambium to cambium contact. So what this whip and tongue technique does is it kind of holds it in place better but it also increases the chances of, of a bud take because look at the extra surface, cut surface area you have for the potential for connections with the cambium between the two, between the rootstock and the scion. So when you do that, you increase your chances of success. Then you tie it off securely. You could use the tape that I showed you before, or you can use, uh, String, you can use just about anything, but you need to seal it off somehow so it doesn't dry out. In some cases, uh, if you look at some of the literature, I think before they had all this, all the, uh, the uh, budding tape that they have nowadays, they used to use wax a lot and they would melt it and then they would paint it on and seal it off. And in some cases that's still used. That may be what this is depicting, but, but in general, you could just tie it off with, with budding tape. Anything that keeps it from drying out and holds it securely in place. See here, here it is with the, what I'm talking about. This is wax. They heat it up, get it to its melting point, and then they brush it on and seal it off like that. That's old school, but it's probably still done. Okay. Um, so that's the whip and tongue, which is probably the most common nursery grafting technique. So if you're, if you're not budding, if you're not doing the tea bud or the chip bud, there's a good chance you're doing the whip graft or the whip and tongue. And some whip grafts would just be a cut like this without the second cut that we talked about, because that second cut is kind of what we call the tongue. So you could have a whip graph without that second cut, or you could have the whip and tongue that we just talked about. All right, um, bark grafting. So now uh, let's talk about a couple of, of techniques that are used to top work existing orchards. Remember what we talked about earlier, top working is where you want to change the variety, but you don't want to replant trees. You want to, you want to save the existing orchard or the trees in the orchard, but you want to change the variety. Or you might want to graft in some pollinizer limbs. That's occasionally done. So you have better cross pollination in the orchard, but usually it's to change the variety. And you can save yourself years by, uh, if you have healthy plants, by top working them versus starting over. Uh, so the one technique to do this is the bark graft. 
which is shown illustrated here. And this technique needs to be done when the bark is slipping. Okay, just like tea budding. The bark needs to be slipping. So because you're going to peel, you're going to make a cut. First of all, you're going to cut a large limb, cut it back. Usually it's relatively large compared to the cyan, it's large. And then you're going to make a, a cut, two cut vertical cuts like that and pull this bark back. So you have a flap of bark that's about the same diameter as your cyan stick and your science stick will be tapered it'll have a long slanting cut like this and then a shorter one on the other side and i have more pictures so let's let's look at these pictures okay so this limb was cut back now they're they're preparing the limb now they're preparing the cyan so it has a long slanting cut on one side and the other side has a shorter slanting cut coming to a point, okay? And then you prepare where you've made, where you've cut the limb off, you prepare where you're gonna put the cyan stick, bud stick, by peeling back that bark, and then you slip it in. And there's different ways of securing it. Uh, this is actually adhesive tape, because you're, you're gonna need something pretty strong and that you can get it really tight and, and hold this bud in place, these bud sticks, because they're out in the elements, you know, uh, wind, rain, birds, squirrels, what have you. So you need this really secure. Sometimes little small nails, you can use like little bitty finishing nails and just hammer them in and hold the bud stick in, securely in place. But, it, but at any rate, you secure it in place and then in this case, they were using, uh, again, the, uh, the melted wax or, or some kind of melted material, some kind of wax usually painted on there to seal it off so water won't be lost while you're waiting on the cyan to grow. Now, this, now let me mention this. The cyan wood is dormant. But the rootstock, the bark was slipping, so it's not dormant, it's an active growth. So this technique is usually done after growth begins in the spring. It could be done in April or, or May or even. But the bud wood or the cyan wood needs to be collected during dormancy. So for this technique, you need to plan ahead. You would collect your bud wood while it's dormant, maybe during the maybe during January, early February, before it starts growing. Uh, then you store it, as we discussed, um, in a cool, moist environment like a refrigerator and Ziploc baggies with something moist in there with them. And you store it like that, and then you bring it out when the rootstock is ready. So these are dormant, some dormant bud sticks, but the actively growing rootstock plant here. So that's the way you do um, the bark graft. And that's a common way, a very common way of uh, top working plants. Now, this next technique is called the clef graph. Maybe you've heard of it, but it involves similarly, you cut the cut a branch off, the branch that you want to change varieties on. Just make a cut like that. But then you're going to split that branch and you're going to insert some bud sticks in the slit that you made lining up again lining up the cambium so you so let's let's look at this in a little more detail so you make this initial cut then you you split it and you use a, a tool like this i don't know if you can see this but this is a sharp edge and you put that on the end of the branch and then you hit it with a mallet or a hammer and you force it down in there 
and you make this split. Then you take this part of, of the tool, the cleft drafting tool, and you force it in the center of your cut that you made to pull, to, to pull this open. So you have this gap here. Okay. Then you prepare your cyan by cutting it. It doesn't have to be to a point, but it needs to be tapered. And it's tapered in a way that the inside of it, what's going to be the inside part of the cyan, is narrower than the outside. And uh, I have another picture of this we'll look at in a minute that I hope will make it clear. But so you're going to have this tapered bud stick here. You put it while you're holding the holding this branch cut open, you insert these scions, and it's good to do at least, you know, to do two, because you may remove one of them later, but it increases your chances of success. And notice here that the cambium is lined up between the rootstock and the bud stick or the scion. So the outside isn't lined up. It's this cambium, this layer under the bark that's lined up. So you get good contact there. Then as with the other techniques, you would cover that, seal it off um, with wax or something. And let's take a look here and see if we can see some uh, pictures. There's a finished one there. But OK, so here's the grafting tool. You put it on the end where you've cut off the branch. You hammer it in with a mallet. So you've made that split. Then you take that pointed part of the grafting tool and you force it into the cut that you made to hold this open. Then you prepare the cyan wood, as you see here. Nice, long, smooth cuts, tapered so it's thinner on the inside than the outside. You do two of them usually. And then you put them in there while this tool is holding that apart. Then you pull the tool out and the force, you know, the natural force of the limb, the, the wood will tend to try to go back to its original shape. So it will press on these bud sticks and make a, hopefully make a good contact with the cambium on both. And then you seal it off however you want to. And, and with these kind of techniques like bark grafting and cleft grafting, the wax is really good because you can just cover everything real easily, where with wrapping tape or something, it'd be hard to do that. So this is where the grafting wax comes in handy. And you also, I don't know if you can see it, but all, quite often you put a little wax on the end of these bud sticks as well because they can lose water out the top. So you would cover that. See, you can see it here in the illustration. So you paint the ends of the bud sticks as well to seal them off. OK, now in this case, they covered it with foil. Uh, it looks like they wrapped the whole bud stick with, with budding tape and then covered it with foil to reduce the heat. Um, so that's a technique you can use too. Uh, sometimes aluminum foil attracts critters, birds and stuff, crows and stuff. So, you know, I don't know that may or may not work to your advantage, but the idea here was, I think, to reduce the heat. And heat means dry, you know, all other things equal heat equates to drying out. So they're trying to minimize stress and drying out. Okay, now we talked about this already a little bit. So, so anyway, those are the, the main grafting techniques and budding techniques that I wanted to talk about today. And, and just by way of review, that's the, the uh, T bud or shield bud then the inverted T, which is done with citrus because it bleeds a lot of sap. Then the chip bud, which is another budding technique, but the bark doesn't need to slip 
with chip bud like it does with tea bud. So chip bud might be done, say, in the fall when the plant's starting to tighten up and not as actively growing. So, so we have the tea bud, the chip bud. Then in terms of grafting, we have the whip graft and the uh, whip and tongue graft, very similar. And then we have the bark graft and the uh, cleft graft. Now, one other one that I don't have pictures of, but I'll just mention it real quick because it's similar. Let me find the bark here. Okay. Um, okay. So there is another technique. It's called a bark graft. And imagine, if you will, that, that this is a smaller shoot. It's like a nursery tree instead of this big old limb. And it's actively growing. And you can essentially, when the bark is slipping readily, you can remove a portion of bark you know, a little square or rectangular area of bark from the rootstock. Then you go to your cyan plant and you do the same thing. You remove uh, a matching portion of bark from your cyan bud stick, which contains a bud, and you place it there where you've made this little uh, area with no bark. You replace it with bark from the science bud stick that contains a bud. And then you just wrap it, seal it off. And that's just called a bark graft. And it's pretty common as well. Um, I didn't have any good pictures of it, but it, I think you can visualize what I'm talking about. And as long as the bark is slipping and it's a type of plant that has a pretty thick, robust bark to work with, you can, you can usually use that technique as well. So let's talk about bud forcing just real quick. Uh, we already addressed this a little bit, but now if you're whip grafting or doing cleft grafting or bark grafting where the cyan is on the end of the plant, on the terminal part of the plant, you don't have to do any forcing because naturally it's at the top of the plant. There's nothing above it inhibiting it from growing. So when it's ready to grow, if you had successful graft union, it will grow. But with budding, remember you're putting a bud in the side of a plant that has a top above it. And so that bud, just like all the other buds on that plant, aren't necessarily going to start growing unless you disrupt apical dominance. So there's different ways of doing that. Um, and this is an example of top removal, but you can also, I don't have good pictures, but you can also just bend this over instead of cutting it off and leave it attached. And the thinking is, if you do that, this portion of the plant that you bent over is still going to provide nourishment and support to this growing cyan, but without inhibiting it because you've bent it over so it's not up here producing auxin that flows down, but rather you bend it down, tied it to the base of the plant or something like that. So the auxin won't flow uphill like that and around, but growth substances will, carbohydrates and other things that might be needed will grow, will uh, move uphill like that, so to speak, to this developing bud. So there's different ways of forcing this bud to grow. Remove the top, bend it over. There's another technique called lopping where you cut part way through, but not all the way through, and then break it over, just bend it over. So it's still attached, still partially attached while this bud develops. The thinking again is that that attached top is helping support the growth of this bud. But you see, when we cut this top off, see all these other buds that were, were dormant, but now they're growing? That's what I'm talking about. So all these buds, including the one we inserted here, were dormant, and they weren't going to grow until we did something, which in this case was removing the top. Now they're all starting to grow. 
So we have to periodically remove these to make sure that the one we want, which is the bud we inserted, is the one that grows and takes over as the main part of the plant. So we just have to, you know, when you're doing your forcing, you have to occasionally, every few days, you have to look, rub off or remove these developing buds that you don't want. Okay. After care, well, this is just common sense. Um, you want to avoid any stresses that you can. That's going to facilitate healing of the graft union or the bud union. You don't want the plant stressed. You don't want to overwater it. You don't want to underwater it. You don't want it be excessively hot or there's no reason for it to be exposed to direct sunlight usually. So typically a kind of a cool shady area is best most, most of the time. Um, the thing you have to remember is if you cut the top off, if these, you know, these are probably going to be growing in containers. And if you cut this top off, then the amount of water that this plant all of a sudden the amount of water that this plant needs is much, much, much less than it was when it had that top and it was transpiring all that water. So remember when you cut the top off or do anything drastic like that, you have to adjust your irrigation appropriately or you could accidentally cause a stress from excessively wet roots, which can be just as bad as dry roots. So Try to minimize any stresses, including heat, drought, or excessive water. And um, give the plant, you know, at least 18 to 21 days to heal. And that's what I like about this, this kind of clear budding tape. You can sort of see through it a little bit, so you can kind of see what's going on. But after, you know, after about 21 days, you could remove the tape and take a look. And if it's green, if the bud is still green and plump and not turning black or brown from the, from the top and bottom and obviously shriveling, then the chances are you got good tape. So what you're looking for, let's see if I, well, I don't know. Excuse me, I'll go way back and find it. Yeah, what you're looking for with a successful bud take, you'll usually see callus formation where the flaps were uh, pushed apart and you, and you push the bud up under here, you'll see flaps, uh, callus there. Uh, but the main thing you're looking for is this bud is still green and, if, and it's not wrinkled. If it's starting to wrinkle and shrivel, that means it's drying up. And usually if it's doing that, it's also turning black or brown up here at the end, at the two ends, the top and the bottom ends. And so if you see that, it's probably, probably wasn't successful. So um, you can unwrap it, like I said, after, you know, after about 21 days. If it doesn't look like it's ready, then you can rewrap it. So it's not a problem. Uh, Let's see, quickly, because I'm running out of time, we'll talk about some unusual grafting techniques. These aren't just for, you know, these aren't every day for creating nursery plants or creating plants that we want to grow. These usually have more to do with trying to save an existing plant. And they're pretty rare, to be honest with you. But this is bridge grafting. Let's say you had a specimen plant somewhere and it incurred some kind of major damage to the trunk that was causing the, you know, the plant to decline, the tree to decline. These are usually done on big plants. You can do what's called bridge grafting. You can see what they've done here without getting into the nitty gritty. They've just created some bridges here by grafting above and below the injured area. And if these were successful, they will continue to grow and as they get larger and grow, they will conduct more and more 
water and nutrients over that damaged area. So that's, that's called bridge grafting. And then in arching, it's a similar idea. Let's say you have an existing specimen plant and it's got a very compromised, something happened to make its root system very weak and, um, and it's declining. Sometimes you can bring it back or prevent it from declining by doing this in arching, which is essentially taking some plants. Now there, you can't see it, but there would be healthy root system at the bottom of these, these which look like little sticks, but they're actually little trees. And so there'd be roots underneath here. And so what they've done is they're grafting these into the plant. So these root systems will develop and nourish the existing tree. So again, pretty rare, but just Kind of worth mentioning, I guess. Now, air layering. Um, air layering is another technique. Let's say um, you have a, a plant that is not, you know, you don't need a rootstock. Um, and maybe, uh, like, maybe, like, this looks like a rubber tree here, which is probably a good example. Um, so you have a plant, it's a rootstock is not needed, but you want to propagate it asexually. And let's say that it doesn't root, let's say to root from cuttings, you would need like a mist bed and, and all this kind of elaborate setup. Um, and you don't want to do that, or you don't have access to that. So a lot of times you can propagate them through a process called air layering, which you see here. And it's very simple. Um, essentially, from the mother plant, you remove the bark down to the wood around in an area usually, you know, a few inches long, like that. Then you may or may not apply rooting hormone to this area here, uh, depending on you know, you can do a little research and see if it's recommended or needed for a given plant. A lot of times it, it helps. And then after you apply the rooting hormone, you take something like sphagnum peat moss or something like that that's moist but not wet. You squeeze it out real good. And you pack that around this whole area, completely encompassing the area where you've removed the bark. And then you wrap that with something like uh, plastic, some kind of plastic. Like what I do sometimes is I'll take a plastic Ziploc bag, fill it halfway with, with moist sphagnum, and then I'll cut the side of the bag and just put it on there and tie it up, you know, and, it, and seal it up that way. But any way you can manage to do it, the key is tied off good and tight at the top so you don't get rainwater coming in here and collecting and causing a big swamp in here. You don't want it, you don't want excess moisture in here. So you want that tied off real, real good uh, and then tied off at the bottom as well. And you want it also uh, tight enough that it doesn't dry out. So you don't want it to get wet from rain, but you don't want it to dry out either. And then, uh, you know, give it a month or two, and sometimes uh, you might want to cover that with foil because some sometimes roots will develop better in the absence of light than if there's a lot of light. So uh, it can be advantageous to cover that with, with foil. And then you can observe after a couple of months, and if there's a lot of roots growing in there, then you can cut it off below down here, and you essentially have a plant with roots. Um, so here, here's a picture. So see uh, the bark's been removed down to the wood. Then you take this moist sphagnum and you wrap it and you put it next to it and then wrap it up with some kind of plastic and tie it off real good. And then the roots will develop up here at the top, but they'll fill this area if it's successful. And then you just cut below that, you just cut it off 
And you may have to adjust the size of the top to accommodate the roots that you have, but essentially that's how you air layer. And it's good for doing plants that, um, that you can't easily propagate from cuttings because you don't have the right setup or they just don't propagate easily. And if you don't need a rootstock. So, so that's air layering. Now, quickly, this is another, this is mound layering or stool propagation, propagation with stool beds. This is an apple rootstock nursery. So these are all apple rootstock plants. They pile a bunch of sawdust and, or some similar material up around the plant. And then at some point they remove that. And the, it's just the nature of this apple rootstock that it will start developing a root system there if it's been covered with something like sawdust for a period of time. So then they pull that sawdust back and then they cut below the root system. And, voila they have another plant and they cut these plants back uh, each time they cut it back it stimulates several more shoots to grow so before long they can have quite a few shoots in here and propagate their rootstock that way so that's that's called a stool bed but it's a type of layering it's not air layering but it's a type of layering mound you could call it mound layering so anyway, we, you know, just to, to review quickly, uh, what I'd hope you get out of this is the goals and objectives of grafting and budding fruit trees. You know, why are you doing it? Uh, what, what are your objectives? And involved in that is knowing the benefits of rootstocks. So you need to know what rootstocks are, what they're used for, uh, and be helpful to know what crops they're used in and which crops are not. You know, but we didn't cover that, but that's just good, good knowledge. Uh, they're very common in apples, pears, peaches, plums, nectarines. Many, many of your tree fruit orchard crops use rootstocks. Some of your, a lot of your smaller fruit crops don't, like blackberries, blueberries. Now grapes do, usually. So it depends on the crop. But know, know, you know about rootstocks, what benefits they can provide. And then understand the proper, the importance of plant material being at the right stage of development for the technique that you're doing, whether the bark needs to be slipping or not for the technique that you're doing uh, and the importance of good tools. You know, uh, don't skimp on your tools. Get a good knife and take care of it and keep it. And it'll be a good investment. Um, and then, you know, knowing something about the particular uh, plant that you want to propagate there, you know, there with the internet nowadays, there's, you know, references available for just about anything you might need and you can go on and you can look and you can figure out you know for this crop it'd be a tea bud or for this crop it'd be a whip graft you know or a bark graft or a chip bud so you can figure that out because it's going to vary um, but anyway that is kind of uh what i had for you and i think my time's about up but I'm happy to try to address any questions that, that Good. There may be. we've got some we've got some great questions, Jeff. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start with the QA box. Uh, and let's see. Um, if you graft a sensitive plant or a um, susceptible plant onto a disease resistant or a tolerant rootstock, will it help? So trying to think about, you know, imparting that disease resistance um, through the rootstock or the scion. Yeah, very good question. Um, and, you know, the answer you might have expected is it depends. But, <laughs> but I can elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, for example, um, let's say, I mean, I... This isn't commonly done, but um, it's a good example of what you're talking about. Um, there's a bacteria called Xylella, and it causes diseases in all kinds of crops. 
and it, uh, it causes a particular disease in blueberry. And we found that grafting blueberry on sparkleberry improves the tolerance of the top of the plant, the original blueberry plant, to, to this particular pathogen. We just found that by accident, but it does. So that's one example. So there are examples if the pathogen, see xylella spends part of its life cycle down in the roots. So it, it's a bacteria, but it goes and moves down into the roots and then back up and, you know, during the winter, I think it's when it's down in the lower part of the plant. So if the pathogen interacts directly with the root system, then I would say there's a good chance that using a root, uh, a rootstock that's tolerant to a particular disease or pest will be helpful. Um, there, you know, there, so yeah, so uh, Botrysphaeria is a big problem that causes gummosis on peach, and there are some rootstocks, and it often attacks the peach down on the trunk, lower trunk. So there are some rootstocks that are uh, more resistant to gummosis than others, and that can help. Right, and then yeah. uh, Tristesia in citrus, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are certain rootstocks that, that help with Tristasia, definitely. And I'm a little rusty on that because I haven't worked in citrus for like 25 years. But um, yes, rootstocks are important to that. Okay, quick question. Uh, what do you think about beeswax for grafting wax? I think it's good. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I don't use it often. Um, like for example, I but I have some uh, I have some grafting wax right here, and it looks like it could be beeswax. I'm trying to see if it says what it is. But any yeah, I think beeswax would be fine. I don't know the consist at room temperature uh, as long as it's solid or semi-solid and you can and, and then it has a pretty low melting temperature that you can heat it up easily and then use it and then it will uh, harden and stay hard at you know the temperatures that are likely to it's likely to come in contact with i think it'd be fine great great Okay, um, and then someone, um, Wendy Patterson talked about when you're wrapping the tape, um, and she says, I am assuming that you start at the top and wrap to the bottom so that water doesn't leak into the tape. Is that correct? Well, um, I don't know that it matters. Uh, is What's really important, I mean, I've seen them do it both ways. I've seen people do it both ways. But what's really important is that you overlap every time you wrap around. You should probably cover half of your previous wrap and, and keep it real tight. And if you use that real stretchy material and you overlap your wraps good, I think either way will, will be okay. Okay. Okay, um, and this might answer two questions at once. Um, What's uh, what diameter of mango is best to graft a good variety to? Um, and is there a better time to do this for our tropical fruits um, like mango, avocado, et cetera? Yeah, well, um, being up here in Gainesville, I don't do that much uh, with the tropical fruits. Um, so I'm a little bit challenged in that area. Um, Okay. Well, we can. We're gonna have Jeff. We're gonna have Jeff Wozlewski um, on in July, I think. Yeah. So we can ask Jeff back then. But usually, I think you know. I think we want to try to have a, a a time when the plants are actively growing and not it trying to flower. Um, so you know, kind of picking that um, mid mid to late spring time would be uh, would be my guess. But we'll find out what Jeff says in a couple months. Uh, Jeff Wozlewski. Uh, do you have a do you have a book, Jeff, that you recommend for grafting? Do we still have one through IFAS? Uh, you know, I think there is. Um, I know there used to be. I haven't looked it up in a while. Um, 
Okay. I there had there was a, a book called Grafting uh, available at the IFAS bookstore. Yeah. Um, so this, there's a question um, in two pieces. So let's say you have, you're going to be doing top work to an older mature tree, okay? Um, and you recommended kind of creating a shadier environment uh, for that graft to take. So, but your tree is stuck where it is, which is probably in full sun. How can you provide shade or lessen the stress for that graft? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so if you're, I would say uh, the first thing you could do, as we saw with some of those techniques, you can cover them with foil and that will reduce the, the bark from warming up as much from the sun. So that will, that will help. Um, you could also uh, use shade cloth, you know, if you were so inclined, if you could position it over the area that you're working on or over the entire plant, um, shade cloth would be probably be helpful. Okay. Um, if you're doing it, it, you know, depending on the technique and the time of year, it may not be as critical, uh, like if you're doing a uh, cleft graft and it's, early spring before it gets super hot, probably just covering it with foil would be adequate. Okay. And it's funny you mentioned the birds and the foil. I don't know what it is, um, but Karen noticed that she, when, when she was doing air layering, that the birds really did come to that foil and rip it up. So. Yeah, they'll tear it up. And so sometimes, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to know whether you're doing yourself any favors with the foil or not. Right, right. Um, I've got two other questions for you. Oh, actually three. Um, how do you find this budwood and scions out there? You know, um, I think the Master Gardener group is probably a really good resource, you know, just talking to your friends and when they're saying, oh, I've got a really good fill in the blank, you can say, hey, could I get some scion of that? But is it available commercially, Jeff? Um. Well, I'm sure it would be. Um, so here's a couple, couple things. You know, commercially, if you're going after it and you're looking for a commercial source, you know, you're usually talking about hundreds or even yeah. thousands of plants. So if you're just talking about one or two for your home use, probably you know garden clubs and just knowing people, and you know that's probably the best way to do it. Um, there are restrictions, you know, I mean, to, to be, to be perfectly honest, I have to say, you know, you should look into when you're propagating something, you should look into whether or not they're the cultivar you want to propagate is patented or not. And if there's any restrictions on its propagation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get into trouble with that for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, somebody wanted to know the best way to um, to propagate blueberries. Okay. Um, it depends on what you've got at your disposal, but the best way is probably what we call semi-hardwood cuttings, which are like leafy cuttings, but not the super succulent growth. Like for example, um, if, you know, if, if your plants started growing in late February, then after fruit harvest, before you prune them, you would have some, hopefully still have some healthy shoots on there with fully expanded leaves, but not real young growth. And that's what I call semi hardwood. Yeah. And, uh, although semi-softwood would seem to be a better name for it, but it's called semi-hardwood. With that, you need mist. You know, any, any cuttings that have leaves on them, you kind of need mist or at least a humidity chamber. Yeah, you need mist. It's a, yeah. it's a, you know, and I've seen master gardeners set up their own mist beds with um, micro irrigation and, you know, and a, a good intermittent misting timer. So it is possible to do in the backyard um, greenhouse um, but it's a uh, it's a little bit tricky. So to answer your question, it's it's softwood cuttings under mist would yeah, be the best or, way. I mean, 
sometimes you can have limited success with dormant hardwood cuttings. So okay. if, you know, if the alternative to that, you know, if you don't have the mist or, or don't want to deal with all that, you know, the hassle of that, um, you could try to do hardwood cuttings in the winter time. Okay. Um, Linda has a question about her mulberry tree. Her mulberry tree is finished producing. She'd like to prune it from its 15 foot feet down to 10 feet. Um, and I, I think, uh, Linda, it's, you know, it's fair game. You can remove a third of your tree at this point. That's fine. Um, can I graft some of the smaller branches to now shorter, thicker branches? I don't know. I don't think that's, I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessary. I think that mulberry tree is going to produce more mulberries than you can stand. Yeah, I, I think, I think, and you know, unless you had some goal in mind of changing the variety or something, I wouldn't try to do that. Um, um, and then um, Basim in um, Seminole County, he's got a female carob tree. He wants to somehow get it to set fruit, and he's thinking about grafting a male carob scion onto the tree. Have you ever seen anything like that worked? Well, um, I don't know much about the biology of fruit set of the carob tree. Okay. But uh, I have, you know, there are plenty of documented cases in commercial orchards where they might graft a pollinizer variety in amongst another variety to get good cross pollination. Uh, they're not male and female trees in this case, like apples, for example, or pears, but they, they're not self fruitful. So you, you know, what, what some people do is they, they graft a pollinizer variety on several limbs within a few trees and get good cross pollination. I guess you could do that with the carob tree. Sure, I, I, I don't see an issue with that now that you have it, there is a precedent for that. And he says that it's the, at the extension office, so it's an experimental tree anyway. So might as well go ahead and give that a shot. Um, Ruth is saying you can buy budwood from specific orchards, mangoes and avocados. They might cost you up to $5 a piece. Well, that makes about sense. Um, let me see if I think there was one other question. Oh, from Linda, when you graft onto a rootstock in a container, which is my preferred method, uh, how do you know when it's time to replant it in the ground? Um, okay, well, <clears throat> I what what I generally do um, in a case like that is first of all, it, it kind of depends on how long the plant's been in that container, but hopefully it's not already pot bound and needing to be moved. And assuming that it's healthy and happy in the container, then I would let the graph union heal and let the cyan grow for, you know, a couple of months just to make sure that you have good, a good solid connection there. Yeah. And most of what I graph lately has been blueberries because I just work with blueberries and we're doing that research. And what I do with blueberries when I graph them is I let them grow for a couple of months before I move them to the field. And then I may stake them initially, uh, just that for that, maybe the rest of that one season or mm -hmm. for another month or so, because wildlife, a bird could land on it and break it or something, you know, something could happen to it that you didn't expect. But I think, you know, a couple months ought to be long enough to get a good solid union for most plants couple of months. Yeah. And a nice, if the growing season is, is compatible. So that, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Jeff, I think we've answered most of the questions. I want to remind everyone that this has been recorded. It will be posted on the Master Gardener website. Um, also, uh, Jeff, uh, someone has requested, is it, would it be possible to get a PDF of this that I could post also? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That. You've got all your references there. So I think that would be good. Yeah, I think I can send that to you. And yeah, and a lot of those links are interesting, you know, would be interesting for viewers to check out. 
Yeah, yeah. So Michael is asking, um, what's a good source of rootstock for blueberries? I think we're going to have to have you come back and tell the whole uh, uh, the sparkleberry. Um, yeah, the whole, whole sorted tale. That's yeah. uh, right now that there aren't any rootstocks for blueberry. And, and uh, you know, there's really not a pressing. I would say there is a need for it or I wouldn't be working on it, but you certainly can grow blueberries without rootstocks. Sure. I just, uh, just real quick, Michael, that Jeff is working on uh, taking one of our native uh, sparkleberries, which is a, a very adaptable tree or, you know, a pretty tough tree, doesn't have such soil requirements as our regular blueberries do. And he's grafting our rabbit eye or southern high bush onto that. So kind of real innovative work. He's such certainly a pioneer in this, right, Jeff? Yeah, it's uh, it has been done before, but it was never, you know, it's always kind of been looked at, but never carried forward. And uh, we're, we're trying, it's not only me, but we're trying to carry it forward. And things change, you know, um, maybe it didn't make sense 20 years ago, but it might make more sense now, because, you know, it might open up opportunities for machine harvesting and other things. Good. Less pine bark. And I, I want to let the master gardeners know that um, Jeff is the uh, mastermind behind the fruit section of the horticulture ID contest that we do at the conference. So, you know, if he ever puts an orange next to a tangerine next to a, a grapefruit, that's uh, he's kind of diabolical at the conference. So <laughs> we'll have one at the conference next time, which will be in 2025, something like that, 2024. All right, you all. No, no conference this year. No, no conference this year, Jeff. No, I don't surprise you like that. I give you lots of time. I give you lots of time. All right. Uh, everyone loved your presentation, and I really appreciate you being here, Jeff. And we've got to get you back for another topic uh, sometime in the near future. So okay. Appreciate well, it. Happy to do it and enjoy it. Always enjoy it. Maybe, you know, um, I, I enjoy this format, and I guess it expands my reach a lot, apparently. But um, but I always like to meet face to face as well. So, okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Take care, Jeff. Bye bye. Take care.